Household name brands like Molson Coors typically tap traditional advertising channels to reach their massive audiences. But thanks to 2020 and the rise of nonlinear content consumption by consumers, they're exploring new ways to authentically and actively engage their audiences and reach new consumers. In this special episode of On the Mic with Ad Results Media, Steve Shanks, partner and CRO at Ad Results, sits down with Kevin Welsh, senior marketing manager at Molson Coors, to discuss the power of podcast advertising. So let's get started. That's the great thing about Stamps.com. They grow with you. As much fun as I had, I couldn't wait to get back to my sleep number bed. Yep. I love my third love bras. They're hands down the most comfortable bras I've ever owned. I love making Blue Apron. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's my me time. All right, well, let's, uh, let's do this. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now. I want to start by thanking everyone for uh, taking the time today, whether you're here live, watching our YouTube channel, or have downloaded Ad Results Media's amazing podcast on the mic. I'm actually not the host of the podcast, but we'll do my best to keep our five-star rating in place. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Shanks, partner and CR- CRO of Ad Results Media, and I'm joined today by Kevin Welsh, Senior Marketing Manager at Molson Course. We appreciate the great feedback we received following our IAB presentation and the questions you all sent in. A uh, quick recap for those of you who didn't catch the presentation, Kevin and I focused on looking at the art side of podcasting and discussed the importance of authenticity and strong partnerships between the host and the brand. At the end, I called out that one of my favorite part of conferences is having the ability to have a Q&A at close. So that's why we're here today. We received questions from D2C advertisers already in the podcast space, wondering if Molson Coors views the advertising medium the same way they do. We have some questions from large enterprise brands that want to be in the podcast space, but are in need of some guidance. And lastly, we had some questions from networks wanting to make sure that they better understood how brands think, or maybe it's just so that they can better position their sales efforts. While I joke, I think that their questions from the networks uh, will be very valuable for everyone and and are worth covering. All right. Well, I've been rambling on for too long now. Um, So before we dive in, why don't we start with just an easy question, Kevin, and what are some of your favorite podcasts? Oh, that's a good question. You're always keeping me on my toes. So I I, I think I spend most of my time with uh, probably too much, and my wife would tell me this, way too much sports content. So my favorite, my favorite con, uh, podcast that I spend the most time with are probably the Bill Simmons podcast and Pardon My Take. But I try to diversify myself. I, uh, I don't want to reveal myself from a political perspective too much, but I did, I did get into Pod Save America over the past year or so leading up to the election. So that was good. I'm trying to think what else. Um, I really enjoy the rewatchables. I've enjoyed... Some of the other stuff, The Ringer, I feel like The Ringer has like a really strong breadth of uh, breadth of podcasts. So I have really enjoyed what they've done with the Bakari Sellers podcast, Ryan Rosillo. But those, that's where I spend most of my time, I think. Probably pretty prototypical in terms of your middle-aged, Midwest white guy. A lot of sports, a lot of football content. But yeah, that's where I spend most of my time. Nice. Yeah, and it's only fair of me to share as well, although there's a... Part of me that uh, with knowing that there's so many networks on here, don't want to uh, single anyone out <laughs> in particular, but uh, some of my favorites, yeah, you mentioned two of them, uh, Bill Simmons and Part of My Take are, are two that I'm a subscriber of and I'm a, a huge fan of. And they're as a sports fan, you know, they're just must-haves for me. And also as a fan of comedy, I, I do love Part of My Take and they're just natural uh, satire on, on culture. Uh, the the other ones, uh, I'll just call it a few others. Uh, How I Built This, for anyone who loves podcasts and hearing and hearing the entrepreneurial stories of many successful uh, entrepreneurs that, that have had interesting paths of how they got there, like I highly recommend that one. Uh, Guy Raz does an amazing job diving in with each of them. And also, for those who just want to kick back and have a good laugh, uh, Two Bears, One Cave. Uh, definitely not safe for work, uh, so so make sure those headphones are on. But, but a huge fan of uh, that podcast as well. So one one other uh, interesting question that I think it's worth you know discussing on this before we uh, dive deeper into some of the questions from brands and and uh, D 2 C advertisers is uh, do you skip ads? Or they want to know if you skip ads. 
I, I do not skip ads. I, I will say that I, I listen to all my podcasts through my iPhone. I, I really enjoy getting them downloaded right onto my phone. I'm not sure if anyone from Spotify is on the on the line, so it's not I'm not trying to offend you offend you. I still listen to your podcasts, but just through my iPhone. And so with listening to my iPhone, I do I do tend to use the one and a half one and a half speed button though. I find myself when I slow down to to one speed, it sounds it sounds as though the there's something going on mentally with the with the person speaking because it starts to go so slow. So I do take advantage. I I do listen to the ads because I like to hear the ad reads. I guess that's maybe I want to I want to believe that other people are doing that too. I think um, because I'm a big believer in the space, and so um, I do listen to the ads. I I think especially in the in the podcasts that do a a seamless job of integrating them into the content. I enjoy that. So, but I, I do take advantage of this, of the one and a half speed button. And then Spotify does have a 1.2 speed button, which is, is even a nice, even better little like middle zone there. So I am a uh, ad listener. What about you? I am probably one of the anomalies where I, I actually skip some of the content sometimes to listen to the ads. So I, I don't know if I'm a fair person to be asking these questions. I'll download a lot of podcasts and just try to skip and see, uh, you know, where where they're delivering the ads. Like if it's mid rolls, like are they delivering it at 10 minutes in, 12 minutes in, 15 minutes in? Uh, I'm an advertising nerd where I, I find that stuff interesting. You know, are they using utilizing music beds? Uh, all those things. I just think it's important to understand. While, while I have my like key go to podcast, I want to make sure if for the podcast I'm not listening to nearly as as frequently understanding kind of how, how they deliver anything. And also, uh, as I mentioned, we have a ton of network executives actually on this call right now. I want to, if they ever reach out to me, I want to be able to provide the right feedback and guidance of, of how I think podcast can be performing better for the advertisers. But to, yeah. to the, the interesting thing you called out is the speed component. And I, I know we, I've spoken to others who listen one and a half, two, you know, two times and I, I've tried that and I just, my life, I feel like moves quickly, you know, fast enough with, with young kids and, uh, and doing that, just uh, listening at that speed just stresses me out for some reason. So I, I have to listen at normal speed. But. Yeah. My wife thinks I'm crazy because I listen to one and a half speed. Like when I, usually I have a, I have an AirPod in my ear as I'm walking around our condo, but um, every once in a while when it's not in and she hears it, she's like, I don't understand how you can understand what they're saying, but I think I've, I've done it long enough to where like, I'm just like expect them to be talking at that speed. Well, all right, well, let's, uh, let's dive in. So uh, I'm going to start with some questions from some enterprise brands. And I, I was trying to look up before I'll keep them anonymous, but I was trying to look up before if they're in the podcasting space or just dabbling in it. And, and for the most case, they're either not in at all, or some of them are, I think, lightly dabbling with maybe mixed with radio buys, but first question that they sent was, how do you make sure that your message is delivered in a way that is safe for the brand? And they also had in there, do you ever get concerned about a message a podcaster delivers live? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess I kind of want to start with, not to get on like a soapbox or anything, but I kind of want to start with why we why we utilize the space the way we do. I talked about this on the the fireside chat, which was virtual, wasn't wasn't by fire, but um. <laughs> The fireside chat, we we talked a lot about why podcasts are important to us. And I think I kind of harped on the fact that as as a company, Molson Coors, really our marketing vision is to, to build brands people want to hang out with and build brands people give a shit about. We really feel like as you as you look at the media landscape, that it's really hard to find those spaces in a meaningful way and be able to break through. As we are building our media mix um, year over year, we're finding trying to find more ways to break through because we know, especially this young, younger LDA legal drinking age consumer that we're after is hard to break through with, and the media is more fragmented than ever. And so we see podcasts as a way to lean in. Um, it's more of a lean in, opt in experience, and it's really. Uh, you'll hear me say this a couple of times a day, but it's really driven by personalities, and we feel like personality driven media is really the way to connect with consumers, um, whether it's podcasts or custom content or uh, social influencers, all those we would really put in the bucket of personality driven media. And so we're, we're leaning harder into those spaces and podcasts are um, a way, way to do that. And so 
when we made a commitment to really commit to the podcasting space, I talked about this. We wanted to find an expert in the space and we wanted to find someone that was doing it better than anyone else from execution standpoint. And that's why we, that's why we built our partnership with ad results is because um, they were authorities in the space. They had, uh, they had muscle in the space from across or all across the different networks. And I, I guess what goes hand in hand with that is, is the, is the answer to your question is how did we, how do we know, um, or how do we place our brand safely within that? And, and I think, when you talk about personality driven media, you kind of have to have the understanding that you need to push your boundaries a little bit, but at the same time, ad results has done. And I want Steve to talk about this a little bit is ad results has done a really, really good job of helping to navigate our brands in terms of like brand safety. They have a very stringent rules of the game policy that they employ across all of our buys. So we make sure that, um, especially in the alcohol space, we need to make sure that we're not around binge drinking or alcohol abuse or drinking and driving or any, any um, underage drinking, things like that. Like we're not, that's not what our company is about and we don't want to be associated with those type of things. So, but at the same time, when you're in spaces like comedy and culture, like people make jokes and jest and, and stuff like that. And so you have to be careful. And so we, we make sure, and I'm sure depending on whatever segment that you might be in, there might be your different guardrails that you really need to stay away from. And so um, I would say that a long-winded answer is it, it becomes a partnership with your agency and making sure that you guys are on the same page as the best way uh, the the best way to approach that with the networks. All right. Well, I can't say it much better, so I'll try. I'll just add a few details in there of how we manage those processes, and I'll give all credit to uh, our traffic uh, compliance and creative team and our media team as they work together hand in hand with all of these things. So you mentioned a few important things in there. First off is guardrails. I think it's important for any brand to understand what those guardrails are. Hopefully your agency or, or whoever is running the account understands the space well enough to provide that feedback to, you know, if you don't want to be in politics, if you don't want to have strong language within something, if you don't want to have violence, like there's all of those things are areas that the teams need to understand and need to make anyone, any brand aware of before diving in. Because to your point, some podcasts have very crude language and, and we have plenty of clients that are perfectly okay with that and they're not necessarily concerned with it and others who want to stay as far away from that as possible. So it's first understanding the guardrails. Then from there, it's taking it a layer deeper, which you know you mentioned for Molson Coors in particular, uh, you guys don't want you know, if underage drinking, we, we want to make sure we're staying away from drinking and driving. We want to make sure like hosts, like there's even great hosts like uh, Dak Shepard that we know who has been sober or you know, he had a recently relapsed. So I don't want to cover that, but he, he's been sober for a long time and we don't want to put our, you know, Molson Coors in front of as strong as Dax is as a influencer. We don't want to put Molson Coors to connect with that host, with Dax in that way, because we know that measure that when he delivers that message, it'll be inauthentic. And it just is, it's a horrible fit in general. So it's important to understand all of those guidelines and guardrails going into the buy. Then once you're, you know, and I think the other part of the question was, do you ever get concerned about a message yeah. a podcaster delivers live, yeah. which is also just an interesting question to think about is podcast you know, pod is play on demand. So, you yeah. know, there's technically never anything live, but I understand the, uh, you know, they're uh, saying it within stream of thought. Uh, and sometimes when, you know, some podcasts will edit things, some podcasts won't edit things. So I think that's probably where that question comes in. And I, again, I want to give a shout out to our traffic and appliance team that, you know, listens to every single spot to make sure we're identifying all of those things, you know, is it brand safe? Uh, and not just that, but we want to understand on the media side, you know, if we're contracting a 60 second live read, like, is that spot at least 60 seconds? Are they making, you know, if in most of the cases we're, we're utilizing endorsements and we're, we're utilizing influencer in that way, like how, how is that endorser, you know, utilizing that? And the feedback loops we create, because again, the networks who are on here and the podcasters want to make sure that we have that feedback loop so that we can get this, uh, you know, because the, the more connectivity that we have, everybody wins, whether it's, you know, the brand, the network, us, like ev everyone wins. So it's, it's how do you make sure that you're, you're driving that? So again, you know, our teams do that. So it's, you know, 
giving them all the credit, but uh, you know, happy to happy to chat through all that with them. So. Yeah, for sure. And and I, I one other thing I want to add on when you talk about the live thing, I, I think that's part of like when you talk about personality driven media, you have there is a little bit of a leap of faith that you understand that you're going into um, a little bit more risk risky of content, and, and it's not it's that what that risk is is different depending on your brand and your company and whatnot. Um, we've helped establish that and we're still working through. There is still some gray area that we work through with that results, but but we trust the partnership and and we we are we're working through that. I think one thing that I always try to keep in mind is that the people that are tuning into that content are are, are opting into it. And so when you talk about play on demand, like podcast is really an opt-in. It's not like it's being blasted all over the place and like a TV spot or something like that. When you think about it from that regard, the people that are, are tuning in to listen to that, they're used to the way that a podcaster might talk or jokes they might make or direction they might make. And so for the most part, you would hope, even if even if you need to come down on the host or, or the endorser afterwards, you would hope that the, the listener is not going to going to think poorly of the brand um, that's that's near that message um, and, and that they're not offended or that a brand would be sponsoring that because it's opt-in and they're usually opting into a, a relationship with that with that um, podcaster. And uh, before we move on to the next question, I did see on the live chat, someone asked if this will be available on demand to uh, share. And yes, as we're talking about on demand and live stuff, yes, this will be on demand, but uh, I'm going to edit out if I make any mistakes. So uh, it'll be perfectly crisp and clean. <laughs> I didn't see there's a live chat. Wow. Someone wants to connect on LinkedIn. There you go. LinkedIn. All right. Well, we'll, uh, and if we have time, I, I know I saw something in Q and A as well, uh, depending on timing, uh, we'll see if we get to, to live questions. So we're going to cool. go through these questions that were asked in advance first. Um, so, uh, next question, kind of similarly, uh, we've, we currently buy, again, from a large enterprise brand, uh, we currently buy across large networks. How do you determine what shows to pick? Do you only look at the top 100 on the Apple charts or do you look at other podcasts? So we don't just look at the top 100. One thing, uh, well, I can answer that one really quickly. We, we don't just look at the top 100. Um, it is, uh, and it's a, it's a very timely question because we're actually working through um, our 2021 allocations now across our portfolio and starting to starting to think about where we want to place our bets um, for next year or outside of outside of some more cornerstone partnerships that we already have. And it, it is, uh, we ha we work with uh, ad results to to really build our plans in a strategic manner. So it starts with. It starts with our brand brief um, and we really lay out for ad results, what our key pillars are for the year, what our brand triangle from a messaging perspective, what's our brand, what's a specific brand that's all about, what, what that brand is all about, um, and really try to lay out for them, here are the key, key timeframes throughout the year that we want to win. Um, and that sort of like sets the framework as to the framework for which they can work within. And then from there, we really tried to work with them. They have a a specific evaluation criteria um, that they're they're looking to evaluate um, different podcasts on, and that can be that can be go from like the strength of the endorsement to um, where where a podcast is placed in the spot to what we typically see from a duration of a spot, um, how they're delivering the podcast, uh, what are we seeing from a year over year growth from a podcast? Are they are they on the rise? I think ultimately, like the top 100, while that's cool, I think we definitely look at podcasts uh, on a spectrum and you're going to have a mix of the, the large podcast, at least from the way we look at it and what we're investing in the base. We're going to have a mix of large podcasts, um, middle, more middle of the road podcasts, and we definitely see podcasts as a space to reach niche interest. Um, and, and when you talk about niche interest, like look at a brand like our one of our seltzer brands like Vizzy. they're all about having fun having fun and being healthy um in terms of like their their uh their seltzer has antioxidant vitamin c in it and so we're looking for fun pop culture environments um to to spread our message and a space like that that's really relevant is something like the bachelor well if you click if you double click into the bachelor and podcast there you could go probably 100 podcasts deep and so, and that's a mix from 
podcasts that are, are much larger versus ones that are really niche. But um, that's where we really lean into our relationship with ad results to understand where, where they see success across their um, list of list of partners and where, where they see strong endorsements and whatnot. And so I, I really, I really would say it's, it's, it's not just looking to the top 100. It's, it's really a, a process and a mix of looking at a lot of different factors from an evaluation criteria. Yeah, I find, I hear this question a bunch and this is not only, it's interesting because this one comes from uh, an enterprise brand, but I, I hear this from D2C brands or anyone who's jumping into the podcast space of why don't I just buy top 10 on the Apple charts or why don't we just look at the top 20 of the Apple charts or anything along those lines. I, as a quick reminder, there are, or for context, there are over a million plus podcasts. Uh, now granted, most of those are so small that, uh, or not, applicable for ads or live reads or just wouldn't have the scale that uh, most most brands or advertisers looking in the podcast space would, would want to be on unless they did it in a, a different programmatic way uh, with a produced read. But like as we're talking about host reads, it, additionally, like some interesting stats that just came out, it was either this week or last week, like Apple now for the first time ever represents under 50% of all listenership and it's 47% to be exact. Uh, and Spotify now is nearly 25%. So uh, in a few years, if we get the same question, it may be, are we looking at the Spotify charts to the top 100 Spotify charts to, uh, to purchase podcasts? And I think it's important to know that, and you kind of covered off on it, Kevin, like there's a bunch of different inputs that go into it. Like we do, having scale is very important. Having strong engagement with that host and that audience is very important. And maybe the charts, you know, partially tell that story. I'm um, yeah. using an analogy, a sports analogy from one of my colleagues, Russell, and anyone who isn't a big sports or football fan, I, I apologize for this. And um, I'll try to think of maybe a bachelorette of, uh, analogy yeah. one day to, uh, to fill in a spot. But uh, if you just looked at the numbers, you know, certain times you don't necessarily, if you're in the NFL and you're looking at numbers of how fast you run, how, you know, how high you jump, how hard you throw the ball, it doesn't necessarily correlate to how strong that individual is actually going to be and what they do with that audience. So like Tom Brady, for example, was a six round, you know, pick 199 of the NFL draft. If you're only focusing on the top of, you know, certain set of numbers, you're going to miss out on the Tom Brady's, the Russell Wilson's, the yeah. Aaron Rodgers, all, all of these great, you know, I'm just naming quarterbacks, but you're going to miss out on all of those top choices. So for us, Yes, it's an input, but it's definitely not something you should be relying on. And I won't even get in <clears throat> get into how some some shows, I believe, and networks are gaming some of the system there. So, like, I, I wouldn't focus too much on what's at the top of the charts. I would focus more on you know which podcast you believe uh, truly engage with those audiences. Yeah, and that, that, the way you were laying that out really sparked another thing for me. I like I, I mentioned it at the beginning, but it really does start with us as like. What's your brand brief? What's your brand positioning? Where do you need to win? Or where do you feel like, what do you think, What? where do you feel like podcasts, what What purpose are they serving within your overall media mix? I was just thinking like we're working with you guys on, we're launching, we're now Molson Coors Beverage Company. We're not um, only alcoholic beverages. We are launching, for instance, a probiotic seltzer water. And it's a, it's a DTC brand. It's called Huzzah. And they're really focusing on health. They're focusing the health and wellness space. Well, when you look at the list of podcasts that they're partnering on, it's like, it's not going to be like a specifically any like really large podcast, but it's, we're really focusing in on sort of niche audiences across a, a, a bunch of smaller podcasts. Um, but we feel like we can win in that space. And so we've really like when you look at it from that perspective like none of those are probably touching the top 100 podcasts out there but we feel like once we go to execute they're gonna we're gonna be reaching a really relevant audience and so it should should work out well and that's not rocket science by any means but i just wanted to give an example of we have brands that are like mass reach iconic long-standing brands like Miller and coors light but we also have brands that are super niche and use podcasts in a completely different way I think that's an important clarification. Instead of continuing down with all these, because I have them all listed out from brands, we'll, we'll go to a D2C question. And I, the, the way that the question was asked is so perfect uh, D2C performance, like direct response of like understanding every little nuance of measurement. So I won't 
I won't go into how the exact question was phrased as it gets into the very nitty gritty, but essentially uh, one of the follow-up questions to that is some of these D2C brands, and I think others, maybe even networks as well, think that performance may not really be that important to you. So how important is performance to you? We don't care. We see podcasts and we just want to throw them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, got a lot of people very excited there. For like is, the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> hopefully, no one, hopefully no one snips that clip. Um, I'd get in trouble. Performance is really important to us, but we understand. I think we definitely understand that we're, we are entering the space a little bit different than direct to consumer brands, um, except for the example I just gave you with Huzzah. Um, but we're trying to be creative with the way we're approaching it. Like we definitely look at the, and this isn't rocket science, but the historical 70, 20, 10 model of investment. And we look at what are our tried and true aspects of our plan that we're putting 70% of our investment we know are gonna be, we, we measure um, in a very a mi uh, mixed modeling manner. We, we filter into our multi-touch attribution models um, to optimize on the fly. And then we have, we have another 30% of our investment, 20% are things we've tested in a previous year and we're scaling. And then 10% are new and different innovative spaces. I would say podcasts in 2020 for us, the way we went into them, they fell in that 10% range. But as we look towards 2021 and beyond, they're they're moving into the 20% range, that, that the 20%, which are more scalable. How are we scaling against those? Um, and so when we talk about the 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 10%, we're really we really see those as test and and we recognize that they might might not be measured historically the way that other media channels are. Not only I, I think from like a top line perspective, we're working with partners to give us brand lift studies um, and measurement using third party measurement companies, because that's really important that we do third party, not self-reported. From a larger brand tracking perspective, and it's not really in real time, but we're going to be filtering in podcasts into our overall mixed modeling to see a sp specific ROI we get, get against podcasts in comparison to other media channels. And then it, like lower down on the list would be a brand list study through that actual podcast network partner. I, I want to say like, and one of the things that we have unlocked and we have a path forward to do it is more of like the gold standard is pixel-based tracking. And one thing we really want to do is working with Steve, what's the name of the partner we're working with? Or do Pod we want to say it? That's all right. We can say it. Pod oh, sites. I think it was. Pod sites is we want to, pod sites is <laughs> rolling out more and more and, and, what we want to do is is do pixel based tracking across all of our buys to be able to filter that in to our MTA our our multi touch attribution studies to be able to optimize um, in real time about pushing pushing more money into podcasts or uh, moving money around within podcasts to the to the places that we see performing best that are actually tracking the sales. Lastly, I'll say before Steve pops in, one other area that we're really trying to get better at is we're making when, when this was more COVID brought this on as a priority across our across our enterprises how can we make everything more shoppable um, and that means from your social ad to your YouTube buy to your podcast buy and that's making sure that we're building strong strong copy points uh, within within all of our with all of our um, podcasters podcasts and endorsements that are driving a call to action to shop online and what we're doing across certain brands in our portfolio, we're going to make it a little bit more widespread is actually having vanity URLs that, that tie to like our online product locator or on like online product shopper that are, are specifically, specifically tied to a, specific, a certain podcast. So we can try to track measurement there. And so we're using a little bit of the, I would say we're as a big, big box or a CPG advertiser, we're trying to utilize what we're seeing work from a DTC space and utilizing promo codes and vanity URLs as much as we can. So that, that's how I would say we're looking at measurement. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think there's just a general misconception that yeah. brands don't care about performance. Brands are just feeding their models. And in some cases, you know, I, I will say we have spoken to prospective clients who they're buying it in that way right now just because they don't, I don't think they necessarily fully understand the space. So that's, but for someone, you know, such as yourselves who are continuing to increase investment within the space, 
measurement and performance is important and you're not doing this just to throw money at it you're doing yeah. at it you're doing this because you want to drive those consumers uh, to understand better understand your legacy brand or to and reinforce those legacy brands and also to introduce them to new innovative brands that you guys are bringing to the marketplace and you know in many ways you're thinking like you know you have the as you said the big box behind everything but you're thinking like a nimble d to c company to make sure that you're adjusting to the marketplace accordingly and yeah and the one thing i would add on too is it, you like every time you talk you kind of make me think of something else but the performance piece like I, I was talking about like how we're tra trying to track it back to ROI or sales or whatever, but like we, we lean on uh, ad results pretty hard um, in terms of like, are these podcasts like delivering on what they promise? So they have a, they do a great job. I think it's back to your, probably your compliance, um, compliance and traffic team, or you can call out who, who does it, does the work, does the magic, but every single spot that we run across every podcast is graded. We, find out or we get a report back or we, we have the option to go in and listen to every podcast podcast read to see how an endorsement was um how does that rate on our on our overall scale of endorsement and if if a podcast isn't delivering i mean there was at least 10 podcasts across our portfolio this year where the the reads weren't delivering and we yanked the spots like we're not going to spend money against a podcast that's um giving us half effort or not really endorsing after we paid for an endorsement or whatnot. So um, I would say that there is an element of real-time optimization um, and we have a pretty high standard of execution. And if our brand, if we don't feel like our brands are being treated right in a certain space, we're gonna make a optimization right there, which I would, I would call measurement and performance in real time. Uh, absolutely, yeah, we don't, you know, it's not, no matter if you're a small D to C or a large big box, like, there's there's no such there should not be a concept of just free dollars and not care yeah. like you know we we always say we, we like to take pride in our work and like everything needs to be fully buttoned up across the board from a, an end-to-end -end format but Ed, you made me think this question was not asked at all but i i think it's important to uh, a fun question to ask like what what is your view on post rolls post rolls i would never pay a dime for those so <laughs> If they show up on a media plan, I mean, you can give it to me as added value, but I don't think they're very valuable personally. <laughs> I, just wanted, I, I just wanted everyone to hear that. So I just wanted to okay. make sure I don't want to, you know, I, I, I almost, I'm at the point where I almost sometimes think post rolls are like an insult if you uh, put them on yeah, a plan. I feel uh, like they're just like messing with me at that point. <laughs> but if it is added value and you want to throw it in, I, I think I saw a recent article that, uh, you know, for those who fall asleep on a train or something and they catch like, that's where, that, that's who hears the post roll at the real end and like makes it to the end. But uh, otherwise. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I am interested in, um, in this. We don't even need to talk about this right now. Um, it's probably more of like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I'm interested to hear like from like a expert in the space that ad results is like, what's your guys' perspective on, do we, th is there a sense that because podcasts are becoming, you mentioned there's a million podcasts. And with that, consumers are spending more time with them and advertisers are pushing more dollars there. Is there an element that we're seeing that endorsers and hosts are getting getting fat and happy and like that they're not they're not putting as much value into those endorsements that they maybe once did? I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm curious in your perspective of being there from the beginning versus where we are now, because I think there there could be a, a, a place where they're like the bubble bursts in a sense and 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 advertisers are like if you're not gonna if you're or they're gonna it's not not gonna burst but they're gonna be a lot more choiceful about where they're placing their dollars in the space to place them with hosts and endorsers that really respect their brands and give them the quality endorsement that they're paying for yeah that's a great question and uh i think it's worth diving into right now so yeah. So it's a complicated answer. I, I don't think, so at the real beginning, like real, real beginning, and uh, Russell or Marshall, uh, both partners of our firm can uh, you know go through some of these stories. Some of these podcasters like Adam Carolla were recording out of garages and would do three to five minute spots. And like, we're, yeah. we're doing handshake deals and yeah, doing everything exactly. they could to drive everything. So, you know, at the real, real beginning, like it was, 
truly the Wild West. And yeah, I'm sure a lot of people cared. And I think even some were doing it for for hot, like going to like Adam Carolla or some comedians like Bill Burr, Joe Rogan, like they were almost doing this more for fun and, you know, to be better at their craft and just because they enjoyed it. And I don't even necessarily believe in many cases that a lot of them were thinking about the monetization point at the real beginning. Yeah. So fast forward to, you know, today, the host, and I'll just talk about the host red ads versus kind of throwing in producer red or any of those things or uh, programmatic stuff or anything along those lines. Like I, I do think in general from us seeing the host all the time pre-COVID, uh, I do think all of them are fully bought in, understand the partnerships, at least the ones that were, the, the ones that we're putting dollars into feel that way and believe that and like think that way. Now, what will be interesting is, and this is probably to your question, like we're seeing a lot of dollars flood into the space, uh, you know, with Ringer, with Joe Rogan, with others, you know, I won't, won't, won't name them all off, but like, yeah. I do, I, I do think they still take pride in their work and therefore are gonna try to deliver, you know, an excellent ad read. The, the question will be when we look back at everything and if, if the proof is truly in the, you know, the pudding as we look at the results and reflect and listen, as you mentioned, like we, we listen in all those spots. Let's, let's use Joe Rogan as an example. Like Joe Rogan is still giving two to three minute ad reads right now. And, you know, again, he, I, I think there's also probably the question and that's something maybe, maybe there's never, too, like too much isn't enough for anyone. So like, I, I do think, but like, so I think they all know what got them here. I think they all take pride in it. And I think if anyone falters from that, we'll, we'll see that in the numbers and then we'll pull ad dollars away. So like, it's, you know, we, we want to build those long lasting relationships, partner, you know, it's not even just relationships, it's long lasting partnerships. And, and we want to build upon those. And we want to do it in a fashion where the host knows that they're taken care of appropriately, uh, where the network knows that they're, you know, like, and, and all, most importantly, like the advertisers or the brands, like know, and they're getting the value out of everything. Um, like we have some clients like stamps.com that have been on, you know, different podcasts for nearly 10 years now, like those relationships and partnerships really mean something. And we need to make sure that it's being done in a way where they're not being taken advantage of for their yeah. trust and loyalty from 10 years ago. And I think when we look at five years down from the space or 10 years from now, when we look at Molson Coors and look at all of our clients, we want to make sure that no one's being taken advantage of in any way from, from being there and being investors in that partnership early on. Yeah. And I think that's why it's really important that you have a partner that you trust in the space and you're activating it because we have, we have a lot of different uh, media vehicles that we're executing on measuring, optimizing. And so having a trusted partner in the space that is that is keeping an eye and, and grading and optimizing throughout the plan is really important, I would say. That's kind of that's kind of why I asked the question, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I being able to keep it honest and not just like continuing to flood money in places that it's not, you're not feel like you're getting the most value is is just foolish. Yeah, I, and the, the great news for all of you brands and advertisers out there is that the supply is, I don't want to say endless, but it's just coming in at such a rapid pace that there are so many yeah. great options. So you don't have to feel like you're getting stuck or cornered into a, a single, you know, a single podcast or a single like unit or however you want to think about it. So it, it's, yeah. it's very beneficial for everyone. So um, I know we're uh, starting to run out of time, as crazy as that sounds, but uh, going back to one of the brand questions, then I can dive into some questions from the networks. As we know, they're staying here till the end, so uh, you know we can <laughs> save them for last. The, uh, so one of the brand questions that we received a few different ways, but uh, is it easy to have your AOR work with other agencies? That's it. That's the question. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we we, we received a, it in a few different ways. I wanted to simplify it too. It's it's, uh, but you know, people. We saw from a lot of brands where, you know, maybe they want to work with specialty agencies and it doesn't necessarily have to be podcasts, but like what, like, is it, you know, has it been easy for your AOR, with, you know, to work with us, I guess is probably the best way of asking that question. Yeah, for sure. We have a, we have an awesome, um, awesome AOR that we work with that um, covers all of our, all of our channels really, except for out of home and for. Uh, podcast. So we really, we, we have a great relationship with them. And, uh, but I, as I said, when we, 
when we made a commitment to move into the space with impact, we we also made the made the decision that we wanted to work with what we what we deemed as an expert in the space, and that's why we went with ad results. But part of going into that is is there's a ways of working, and really the way way we've developed it is like the the agency of record um, is is really tied tied closely working with our creative agency and working with our brand teams at the um, at the Molson at Molson Coors, and so. They're really developing from the get-go. They're the one that's going to be developing the media mix recommendation and the rationale for the the budget overall budget that we're allocating to the podcast budget. And it's good, I, I guess. The then you'd ask the question: Well, if they're not controlling it, would they allocate less to it? And the good thing is we have we have a little bit of a safety in that regard. One, we trust them, and we we don't think that they would that they're going to build the recommendation that's best for for the brand, but. We also have the safeguard of we have an internal media team at Molson Coors that are subject matter expertise, subject matter experts and working right alongside the brand teams. Um, and so we have that safeguard of, of we have the understanding like if we don't think we're investing enough in a certain channel, we're gonna we're gonna push them to push more money in different places and and in that that regard. So the strategy team really takes takes the lead in terms of a media mix recommendation. But once we have that media mix recommendation, we are really picking up that budget and bringing it to ad results um, from a from a tactical perspective. And ad results is really taking everything from that regard on. They're taking it from a tactical recommendation perspective, negotiations, uh, kickoff, trafficking, um, and measurement. Everything, every step beyond that is really, is really going through ad results. And I, I would say that place that we really are we've kind of dipped our toe in the water this year and we're uh in a couple of a couple of different areas that we'll probably be pushing further into next year is how do you do those 360 those 360 content partnerships what we really see from that regard is we're gonna we're gonna have whoever has sort of the we feel has the strongest negotiation um or strong stronger leverage with with a particular media partner or network that particular agency would lead the negotiation. Um, and then when it comes to actual actual tactical execution, ad results is going to be ad results would handle any podcast or audio portion of the buy and they would also handle extensions. So if a podcast has a social extension or um, a social a, a YouTube channel that is a, it's a direct like that we're running pre-roll in or something like that, ad results would handle that portion of it. but anything beyond like a, pre-roll buy or anything, a, a custom video content, things like that, we would we would lean on um, our agency of record to execute that. And, and really that's not to say ad results couldn't do that, but we are already paying, um, we're paying FTEs at the agency of record to execute that. They have um, a really strong process in place and things like that. So that's how we're executing, executing and having that partnership between the two. Um, and it's worked out really well so far. We, I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit concerned about going into it, but that wasn't um, on either of the agencies' part. It's just like it's just a little bit awkward, but um, it's worked out really well. Yeah, no, you, you put it perfect. Like it's uh, it's interesting going into it because you don't know exactly how all the yeah. personalities will play, how everything. And like at, at the end of the day, we need to make sure it's easier for you guys. Like we don't want to make anything harder at extra time. Uh, yeah. And your AOR has been unbelievable partners with us. And uh, it's, you know, all you mentioned the safeguards in place, but like we, we, we all communicate and are able to, to share what we need to share with each other internally to make this a uh, very simple process. So like they, I would recommend your AOR to others if uh, they need recommendations, but like, yeah, yeah work, working with them has been fantastic. So I, yeah. I think that's, that's a good call because I, I think a lot of brands are nervous about ever using any specialty agencies again, whether it's podcast, out of home, or yeah. anything. So, so yeah, the um, um, and this is in reference to the conference. It said, I heard you mention the 360 element during the barstool portion of the conference. How valuable is that 360 component in determining which podcasters you want to invest in? That's a good question. And I would say we've actually, I've had this conversation with my team um, a couple times in the past week, the more like when we talk about personality driven media and the, the stickiness and authenticity of partnering directly with a, a personality that has 
has equity with, with the consumer that you care about, like that's what we care most about. So whether that, if, if that, that particular person is, is strong, is strongest only in audio, or that's where they have their strongest audience, we're really only going to partner with an audio. I think a good example of that, and this isn't to say Bill Simmons isn't, isn't strong in video or anything like that. He, he is strong in video, but we don't, he doesn't have like a Bill Simmons show, like social channel or uh, video extension, or doesn't do onset integration and things like that. So we really focus, that's like one of our bigger partners on our podcast plan. And we focus only on audio with him. But if, if a part, we, we want to extend into 360, wherever that, the, those partners are relevant in 360. So if you have the social audience and your show has a social audience, we want to extend there. If you're, if you're filming your show and, and people are going to YouTube to watch clips of your show and there's an opportunity to integrate on the set, we want to be there. Um, we want to be wherever that personality or that show has the audience um, because we feel that the the relationship lives beyond lives beyond the podcast. Not you're like if you if you listen to them and you're do, uh, dedicating an hour, two hours, three hours of your time with them on audio a week. Chances are you're you're checking you're following them in social. You follow them in YouTube and you're watching short little clips that you enjoyed from the week. Or if you miss an episode, you're watching a clip. And so where they have those relevant audiences and where they can prove out those audiences, we want to be there. And I think I I'd completely glazed over the fact that in COVID times, it's not quite as relevant, but we definitely, we definitely see podcasts as a place that uh, you can connect and build a tighter bond with your audience through um, live, live event activation and get, getting the actual product in hands and doing meet and greets and things like that. That was something that we did have as a relatively big element of our plan going into 2020. Um, it was kind of put on the back, board, back burner due to COVID and something we're looking to bring back because a lot of these podcasts are doing really relevant. They're doing tours, they're doing live event shows, things like that, that are they're doing meet and greets that uh, really connect with their consumers in a in an in-person manner and our brands want to be there when those type of things happen. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, uh, I think we're all hoping that in 2021 that we're yeah. all going to be able to, <laughs> maybe it'll be the year of live events once, uh, once everything comes back to somewhat normalcy. So, uh, hopefully, hopefully that's the case. Now I, and looking over most of the other network questions, we actually really covered off on most everything. I, I did see an anonymous, uh, attendee asked a live Q and a, Thing, and I'm guessing this person's from Gimlet uh, or Spotify. Apologies if I'm wrong, but it said, uh, "Most of course, execution with the Gimlet podcast really stand out to me." Can you talk about the negotiation and activation that happened there? So, well, we can. You, know, <laughs> you don't have to go in depth on that. I actually, can't speak that. You can probably speak to it better than me. I know that we did a partnership with Miller High Life and some Gimlet podcasts, but I wasn't close to the negotiation of it. I, I really I, I didn't really set myself up too much um, at the beginning, but I oversee the above premium brands at Molson Coors, um, so I'm doing all all media strategy and activation um, work with our agency of record, and also work right alongside the brand teams on setting up best practices and execution of all their their media dollars as part of their overall marketing budget across above premium brands. So that includes above premium beers. Uh, like Blue Moon, Peroni, Pilsner, Kell, Soul, but it also includes above premium flavor because we're moving beyond beer. Things like seltzers, uh, Vizzy Hard Seltzer, uh, Coors Seltzer, right on cue, nice Steve. Um, Arnold Palmer Spiked, and a, and a whole host of other other really awesome brands. But alongside of that, really passionate in the podcast space, and so when we were talking about as a team moving into the podcast space, I raised my hand to sort of lead. Um, lead our brands into that space, set up a set up a best practice, work right with ad results to set up best practices for how we're going to operate in the space, um, ways of working with our agency of record, ways of working from the brand team, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I would say, really long-winded answer, I helped set up the framework of how we were going to go into the partnership with Gimlet, but I, I can't speak to the negotiation um, and that particular execution. Yeah. I do know that that uh, High Life was is is happy with uh, yeah. with that partnership. I think. 
No, absolutely. And uh, I don't want to go into any particulars with any negotiation because I don't want to reveal any of that information. <laughs> this person did clarify that they are not with Gimlet or Spotify, just a completely neutral podcast listener with a Gimlet email address. Now I'm joking that last one. <laughs> so no, neutral listener. So obviously, uh, whoever this attendee is uh, really connected with that. So hopefully they're uh, going to have some Miller highlights uh, this weekend. So uh, yeah, hopefully that for sure. But uh Awesome. I mean, this was all fantastic. I hope for everyone who joined or who's joining on demand, uh, this was uh, very informative for you. So uh, now that our work is done, it's time to uh, grab grab that Miller High Life or beer or seltzer and uh, here, I'll make sure I have it for the camera and uh, cheers. Thanks everyone. Five it's five o'clock somewhere. Cheers. I, absolutely. Cheers. Take care everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe for updates on future episodes and leave us a comment with your feedback, questions, or ideas for future segments. If you would like more info on Ad Results Media and what we do, please visit us online at adresultsmedia.com. This podcast is an Ad Results Media production.